Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Evershed Sutherland podcast. My name is Caroline Andrathia, and I am the real estate professional support lawyer to the real estate group here at Evershed Sutherland. I'm joined this morning by Anisha Polson, who is a member of our London tax team. Morning, Anisha. Morning. Uh, some housekeeping before we start. Um, I have put everybody on mute so that we don't get background noise. But just because you're on mute doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. You're very welcome to drop questions and comments as we go through the session using the chat feature on the WebEx. You can choose to send a comment or a question just to me, Caroline Andresia, or you can pick the drop down everyone. So that's your choice entirely. Depending on where we are at the session, and how in full flow Anisha is, we will either stop and take a question there and then, or we will save them up for the end. So if your question hasn't been dealt with during the session, then don't worry, we will stay on at the end to deal with any outstanding questions and any further questions that anyone else wants to raise. The session is being recorded, and you will be able to download and re-listen, uh, should you wish to, from our PropCast's webpage. Uh, we will definitely finish promptly at 9.30. Um, I appreciate you all have busy days, so we commit to starting and finishing on time. Uh, so, with the housekeeping over, today's topic um, is the mysteries of stamp duty land tax and renewal leases. Very much a mystery to me, which is why I have brought along Anisha. Uh, Anisha, do you want to just tell us a bit about who you are in your work, just the kind of context of why I brought you along to help us out with the very dark art <laughs> of SDLT and lease renewals? Yes, of course. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just to add a bit of context here, the focus of my work is real estate tax, and this ranges from um, your relatively straightforward property acquisitions to your GCs to more complex and structured direct and indirect transactions, all the way to um, things like securitization of rental income. But as you say, today's focus is, of course, stamp duty land tax, or SDLT as we more commonly refer to it. Um, it's worth noting at the outset that we are only referring to properties in England. Since 2015 for Scotland and 2018 for Wales, um, they both have their own stamp tax regimes in place, LBTT and LTT. There are some similarities between all three regimes, but it's also worth noting that there are areas of divergence. Okay, it used to be a lot simpler, didn't it? Did we just had stamp duty, at one thing, just stamp duty at half a percent, and then it went to SDLT everywhere, then it went to SDLT and LBTT, and then it went from SDLT and LBTT to SDLT and LBTT LBT. and LTT. Indeed. So, <laughs> right. Okay, so um, shall we start, given that it's going to be quite jargon heavy, uh, with some of the kind of jargon and specific terms that we're looking at? Should we, should we take that? To, to, as our starting point, just so we're all on the same page as you talk. Absolutely. I think that's a good starting point. Firstly, just to clarify, we will only be looking at commercial property in the session. Given the length um, of the session and what we have to get through, we will not be discussing residential property. We'll also be looking at renewal leases. So for ease, I will refer to original leases that are being renewed as the first lease. Right, so we've got a first lease and a renewal lease. Exactly, right. exactly, mm -hmm. so that we don't get confused. Um, the second point to note is we will refer to the date of grant. This is the actual date on which a lease is granted. So that's the date of completion. When exactly. we all date the lease, it's signed, date the lease, that's the date of grant. That's right, got that's you. right. Mm -hmm. And this is different to a term start date. And this is the date on which the lease is set to commence. So this might be the date of grant. It might be earlier. It might be later. So it's literally the term commencement date. Okay. So that is the date in the lease by which your 10 years or your five years exactly. is calculated. Your 10 years runs okay. from. Because yeah. speaking as a kind of techie landlord and tenant mm -hmm. lawyer, of course, a term cannot start until it is actually granted. That's right. But here we have to make the difference between the date of grant, which is the date the lease is completed, mm -hmm. and the date from which the term is calculated, which we're going to refer to as the term start date. Exactly. Often backdated, say, the quarter day before, mm. or sometimes if it's uh, a reversion release, it might be a date in the future, right? That's our term start date. Exactly Fine. right. Mm -hmm. And we make this differentiation because SELT legislation treats it in a slightly different manner. Okay, just to confuse us. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And finally, we'll also be looking at renewal of first leases which were granted in the SDLT regime, so after the 1st of December 2003 date. I will touch very briefly on stamp duty leases, but as we are all aware, you know, they're phasing out over time. Okay, so here we're talking about a first lease 
that was after the 1st of December 2003, That's right, yeah. which is when SDLT came into force, I was there, <laughs> um, and, and renewal leases of those leases, uh, not stamp duty leases where we paid stamp duty on those leases mm -hmm. and then are renewing those. Okay, so yeah. we're talking about a lease on which we paid SDLT in the first place. Right, exactly. I've got right. that. Okay, so um, given that it's all very techy and uh, given that us mere mortals struggle with the tax law anyway, we've got some specific scenarios to work through, haven't we? Some of those which are most commonly encountered uh, in a landlord and tenant arena, uh, arena, and so we can pin down what you're saying to a particular scenario. So mm -hmm. let's go uh, for scenario number one. Um, we've got SDLT first lease, as we said, we're just talking about first leases where we've paid SDLT. It's not contracted out of the 1954 Act, so it's got the protection of the 54 Act, and the tenant holds over. So the lease has expired, its contractual term has ended, but under the 54 Act, the tenant is just sitting there holding over, continuing to occupy, maybe continuing to pay his rent. And at some point during that first year, the landlord and tenant come to an agreement for a renewal lease and complete a renewal lease. Mm -hmm. Now that is probably nine times out of 10. Mm -hmm. So why is the tax so tricky on that? Tell me, how do we work it out what we're doing on that one? Absolutely. So in this scenario, I guess our starting point is the first lease was granted in the SDL2 regime. So that's a tick. From a property perspective, it is not contracted out of the 1954 Act. And so, as you say, the tenant has a right to occupy. The first lease has expired, and so the tenant is holding over whilst negotiating the renewal lease. And that's a commonly encountered scenario. From an SDLT perspective, a lease that continues after its fixed term is referred to as a growing lease. Now, that's the phrase you hear, isn't it? A yeah. growing lease. Yeah, the growing lease okay. regime. Yeah. Um, this is then treated as a lease for the original fixed term plus one year longer. So if you had 10 years to start with, mm -hmm. given that this is inside the Act, you know, likely to be, say, 10, yeah. and we stay in as a tenant for a little longer, that is now treated as a 11-year lease. Exactly right. Right. Exactly. So you look back to what SDLT you paid at the outset of the first lease. You redo the calculations by adding one extra year to the term. You then end up with this aggregate SDLT amount to pay. You deduct what you've already paid under the old lease, and then you're left with the remainder that you need to Okay, so you have to sort of lease. effectively top up your SDLT. Exactly. And if your lease your renewal lease was granted part way through that first year, just three months in or six months in, you mm -hmm. still add an extra year? No, you don't. If the lease, renewal lease is granted part way through the first year of holding over, then you will encounter this a little later on, mm -hmm. but you sort of, you treat the first three months of rent and you sort of drag it into the renewal lease. Got you. So this is only if we have been there for over a year, is that right? If you, yeah, exactly. If yeah. you have a full year of holding over, then you have to do some maths at the end of that exactly. first year. Exactly. Okay. So you have to find your SELT return on the original lease because you'll have to find out how you did your yes. calculations and how much you paid. Yes. Um, which might be, say, 11 years yeah. nearly after you made yeah. that calculation. And the rates you're paying on? The rates will be the, you know, the rates that okay. are in place at the moment. Oh, okay, fine. So you have to redo your maths after a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you take off what you paid and you just pay the balance. Exactly. Okay. And often if, you know, we have come across many scenarios where um, clients have not been able to find the original return <laughs> yeah, and you sort of have right. to, uh, you know. You do the calculations all over again. Exactly right. Okay. Exactly. Fine. There's definitely, you know, to um, hang on to the uh, paperwork. Um, and if it's then treated as a growing lease for the original plus another year, so if you held over for a whole year and then held over for another whole year, mm -hmm. you so do your maths again. Exactly. So for every year of holding over, the lease sort of grows per year. So it grows for one year, for the second year, for the third year, and it carries on until a renewal lease is granted. Okay. So um, what if we then, as I said, this is the maths after a whole year. Yeah. Uh, what if we actually, as you say, did it earlier, that bit about yeah. earlier? So, I mean, 
it's quite unusual possibly to go a whole year of holding over, maybe yeah. less so now, but possible. But I'd like to think that most landlords and tenants will get themselves sorted in that first year. Mm -hmm. So if, if renewal lease is granted in the first year of holding over, um, the next question to ask is, what is the term start date of the renewal lease? So as we discussed earlier, the term start is when the lease says the term will commence. If the term start date is backdated to the expiry of the first lease, then no SDLT return is required for the holdover period. You will pay SDLT on the renewal lease as normal from the term start date to the end of the lease. Right, so, so there's no separate return for the no, holding over you, period. You, okay, I've got you, yeah. You sort of drag that holding over period into the renewal lease. Okay, so even if the lease is completed partway through that first year, if the term start date is backdated to the first day after the expiry of your first lease, mm -hmm. then all the rent is part of your STLT return for your renewal lease. Exactly right. Okay, I'm just about hanging on. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. and then the second scenario you look at is if the term start date is within the first year of holding over period, but not backdated all the way. Okay. So you do have these sort of slightly variant yes, you absolutely of do. the same. Yeah. Then again, no SDLT return is required for the holding over period. You pay SDLT on the renewal lease in the usual way, and you calculate a rent from the date immediately after the expiry of the first lease to the end of the lease. So essentially, the first and the second variant gives you the same end the result, same mass, but yeah. you reach it through a slightly different technical analysis. So <laughs> that's oh, kind of okay. I'm going to leave technical analysis to the tax, <laughs> but I'm going to end up paying the same tax. Yes, correct. Okay, I'm going to end up paying the same tax because all the rent I pay is rolled into the tax calculation for the renewal lease. Exactly right. And finally, the scenario where a renewal lease is granted within the first year of holding over, but the term start date is not within that holding over period, perhaps it's in the future, in that case, SDLT is payable and a return needs to be submitted for the holding over period. So that you apply the growing lease treatment for that one year, even though a renewal lease has been granted sort of somewhere in between. Because the term of the renewal lease isn't starting until after the expiry exactly. of that first growing lease year. Exactly. So that's a you know, very nuanced point. Um, and this return usually takes the form of a letter as opposed to a SDLT. So in that so second, in that third scenario, you would do two SDLT returns, one by letter, yeah, to cover your growing over period, period yeah. holding over, and then an ordinary SDLT return for your renewal lease. Exactly. Right. But for scenarios one and two that end up with the same math, yeah, that is just one return exactly for the renewal, renewal lease. lease. So we've got for number one where the term start date is backdated all the way to the expiry of the first lease, just one return in mm -hmm. the usual way. If it's backdated but not quite all the way, yeah. then it's still one return mm -hmm. and the same math. Mm -hmm. The rent is all pulled forward into the renewal lease. Mm -hmm. And then where you have a renewal lease that's granted during that first year of holding over, but in fact you agree the term start date will be more than a year from expiry of the first lease, yeah. Perhaps because you have agreed as a bit of a horse trade that they will continue to pay the lower rent yep. in the first yep. lease for a bit longer, yep. then actually you do two returns. Exactly. One to cover the period of holding over at the lower rent, as if it were a growing lease, as if it, so that bit will be the calculations as we started before, that you have to find what you paid before, and add then the extra grow period, the lease, deduct what you've already paid, pay the balance, send a letter. And then it will also have an ordinary return for the renewal lease. Exactly right. You've got it. Whoa. Well, so <laughs> I've got it now, momentarily. I'm holding on to it. I won't, you know, I'll be finding a tax lawyer straight through. Um, okay, so that is why it, those are all the different scenarios. Why, actually, to a client, it can look so odd mm. that we're doing different things. Exactly. When really exactly. it all depends on how the when that new lease is completed, when the renewal lease is completed, and actually when the term start of that renewal lease is calculated. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, and it gives the tax lawyers very different jobs. Right, okay, fine. That's our first scenario. Right, moving on to the next one. So we're still on an SDLT first lease. We've still got 54 Act protection. The tenant holds over. 
And this time we've got a renewal lease granted during the second or later years of holding over, so we've been holding over quite a long time. And the renewal lease is granted, but it's backdated a long way mm -hmm. back to expiry of the first lease. Yeah. So, okay. Fine. Go for it. Absolutely. So first, let's deal with the holding over period. Mm. In this case, you have a full clear year of holding over or more. If the renewal lease is granted in year three or year four, then you have further full years of holding over. So for each full year of holding over, you need to pay SDLT and file SDLT return. It's worth bearing at this point in time that you only need to file this return and pay the SDLT within 30 days of the end of the holding over period. So this is a bit different from when you have a new lease or a renewal lease and mm -hmm. you, you, know, you file for that particular lease. For holding over periods, the filing obligation actually arises at the end of the holding over period. You need to be aware of it so that you don't miss it. Uh, <laughs> so you're sat there for the whole year, and at the end of the whole year, you then have 30 days to, re to pay exactly your tax right. and to return. And at the end of the whole second year, you have time to put in your return. Exactly. Right. Uh, and I suppose it has to be at the end, doesn't it, rather yeah. than all, because you don't know how long you're going to be holding over for. Exactly. You don't know when years. the renewal lease would be granted. Okay. And is that a, an SDLT return, or is that just a letter? That, that would be a letter. That would be a letter with yes. a little top-up tax. Yes, exactly. So if you stayed in occupation holding over year after year, this is an annual obligation that you have to do. It is. And actually, really trickily, an annual obligation you have to remember exactly. to do. And that's, that's always the trickier part, actually, putting in a you know, <laughs> yeah. time entry or something to remind yourself. And also okay. you'll note that it's 30 days and not the new 14 days. It's just one of those points which... I'm yes. not sure why they, you know, Yeah, because it, you now have 14 days for your first return exactly. where they're tax payable, don't you? But it stayed as 30 days for this particular yeah. scenario. Okay, yeah. but I suppose safety <laughs> get yourself together within well, 14 days. Well, the sooner you can do it, the okay. better. Um, so that is if you're just a tenant sitting there holding over, you've been there for at least a whole year, you have 14 days to do a return, uh, or 30 days maybe. And then actually after the end of the second year, you've got to do the same thing again by letter, redoing your tax. Exactly right. Okay, so if you get to the end of your third or fourth year, your original 10-year term has now grown to, say, 13 years, mm -hmm. but then you take off the tax you paid originally and the tax you paid in the previous right. years of exactly. holding over, if, of course, you remember to do that. Yes, hopefully gotcha. you have. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you'd also need to separately file a return and pay SDLT for the renewal lease in the usual manner. Uh, you would include within the renewal lease calculation any partial years of holding over, so, so, for example, right. you've held over for two and a half years. You do the one year, two year holding over returns, and then for the half year, you drag it, roll pull it into your renewal lease. lease. Exactly. Okay. So, what if we had a renewal lease granted in year two of holding over mm -hmm. uh, at some point during year two, but that term start date is backdated all the way to the expiry of the first lease, which is perhaps more common than you think because, mm. you know, very often, you know, they're people want the neatness of having a continuous mm -hmm. occupation document, authorizing occupation. So they would backdate that lease, you know, sort of, uh, you know, 15 months later, all mm -hmm. the way back to the end of the first year. So presumably they've already, because we've remembered, because we've been taught and we now <laughs> remember, that after the first year, we thought we've been holding over an extra year, right, redo our maths, submit a letter, top up the tax. Mm -hmm. But if I've already done that, Surely if I then have a renewal lease that's backdated all the way to the beginning mm. of the first lease, I'm paying tax on twice mm. on the same period. Yeah, so, so as you say, the tenant has already paid SDL team filed returns for the full holding over periods. You then have a lease which is granted and the term start date is backdated. There, you might think there is a risk of double charge of SDLT, but actually there is a sort of neat way, neat way to make sure that you don't do that. Um, SDLT is payable for the renewal lease on the net present value of the rents payable, but the tenant should not be taxed twice on the same amount of rent. Which is, you know, very good of HMRC. Well, <laughs> well, We're not trying to get a, you think yeah, that quite. makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so the rent for the first year of holding over should be reduced by the rent actually paid by the tenant during the holding over period. So. It sort of works in a very similar manner to overlap relief, if anyone To reduce the, ta the amount on which you pay the tax. Exactly. So, for example, for, during the holding over period, you paid £100 a year, I'm sort of yes. taking figures from the air, um, and that was the rent under the first lease. But when the new lease was granted and you backdated it, the rent is now £120. So, you pay tax on the £20, but you reduce 100 from the 120. So, you're not okay. taxed twice. 
on the same amount of rent, essentially. But that's only if, I suppose, you've remembered to do your return and pay the tax oh, yes, of course. on the extra year's work. Absolutely. And then you'll have paid tax on the 100 so that you can credit yourself with having paid tax on the 100 and just pay on the 20. Oh, yes, absolutely, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, goodness. <clears throat> you see, uh, you know, nobody ever said lawyers had to be mathematicians. <laughs> <laughs> see, this is tricky. Okay, so that's if we had it, uh, renewal lease granted during later years, and then we backdate it all the way to the first year. Right, yep. right, so we do our annual returns, topping up our tax. If it's backdated all the way to the end, uh, to the, book, the last day of the first lease, then actually we 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 take out some of the rent. Yep. We, we don't pay tax on some of the rent. And this, of course, is all self-assessment, isn't it? We have is. to do all the calculations ourselves. We mm -hmm. just fill in the form, send it through. Hopefully, we've got it all right. Okay, fine. Right, so let's go on to the next one. I'm, I'm hanging on. Um, so it's all a bit nuanced. It's all a bit intricate, definitely. So scenario three, uh, again, I've got an STLT first lease because we're sticking with those for now. Um, and then actually, I've got a contracted out lease, say, so that my uh, tenant had, say, a five-year term that was contracted out of the security tenure provisions of the 1954 Act. They have stayed in, but they are not holding over. So they don't necessarily have the right to be there. Maybe mm -hmm. we, the landlord is just tolerating being there while they are negotiating a renewal lease. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point, uh, you know, they all, you know, happy, happy, come to some agreement. Uh, they grant a renewal lease that the landlord is very pleased because he can start charging rent again. He may yeah. not have been collecting rent. He yeah. may have put a rent stop on. So what, is there any difference between a tenant being there under that scenario or a tenant being there under the holding over 54 at scenario we've been discussing? Okay, yes. Yeah. So this is another sort of quite quite tricky scenario. If the term of the new renewal lease um, is backdated to the expiry of the first lease, then the holdover period is not subject to uh, SDLC separately. I say holdover period loosely, but the period yes. where you sort of occupy. Yes. Because of course holdover is a 54 act term, isn't it? Exactly. But we just mean where you're staying in. Exactly, yeah. you're mm -hmm. staying in, um, but you don't necessarily have a right to stay in. So it should not be subject to SDLC separately. Instead, SDLT is payable on the new lease, and you calculate the net present value of the rents from the term start date to end of lease. This is so that none of the rents fall outside the SDLT regime. One point to note, however, is that this analysis assumes, from a property law perspective, that the tenant was staying in the premises under a tenancy at will. So oh, okay. there's no, you know, there shouldn't be no, any implied lease or periodic tenancies, because in respect of those there could be a separate SDLT liability arising. But actually, SDLT is repairable on tenancies at will. Yeah, exactly right. And it's quite common, isn't it? If a tenant is in occupation and a, fifth, and a contracted out lease expires, it's quite common for a landlord to write to a tenant and say, your lease has expired, I'm treating you as a tenant at will. Mm. And sometimes there might actually be a tenancy will agreement, and sometimes the landlord will just write the letter saying, I'm treating you as a tenancy at will, sign this letter, to, to admit that you are. And of course, that's important to the landlord um, to make sure that the tenant doesn't get any 54 Act protection yeah. by way of a periodic tenancy. And it's important to the tenant because otherwise he'd have a periodic tenancy which would give rise to an STLT. Exactly, exactly. quite separate. So actually, yeah. it suits people both sides quite well to be a tenant at will. Yeah. Although, of course, it's quite precarious occupation for the tenant is, because yeah. at any point the landlord could tell him to go, whereas if he was paying rent quarterly, he would have a periodic tenancy which would at least give him three months notice. Protection. Um, but I suppose the most typical scenario is a tenancy at will, and that's got some pros and cons from a tenant's point of view, but the definite pro that mm -hmm. it doesn't have SDLT on it. Yeah, right. and just a further variation to touch on very briefly is where the renewal lease or new lease is not backdated at all, then again, potentially no SDLT is payable. Uh, this is one of those slightly tricky areas where we as a sort of tax lawyers feel slightly uncomfortable, but if the tenant is holding over under a tenancy at will, the rent amount payable should not be subject to SDLT. So you could get a bit of time free. Um, not quite. That is not the end of the <laughs> story. Too good to be true. <laughs> SDLT is then payable on the renewal lease as normal, but the variation to note is you calculate the net present value of the rent from date of grant to end of lease, but then you could also be liable to pay SDLT on any premium, and this includes any rent 
paid before the date of grant. So during the period that you've sort of stayed in place um, and you've paid rent above what was originally paid under the first lease, that amount could be treated as consideration for the grant of the new lease. So actually then you'd be paying SGLT on the rent and on a premium? Yes. And rates on premium are much higher? Right? Yes, that's right, they are higher, okay. yes. Um, and that would happen if we rolled, we had a period of tenancy at will where we weren't paying rent because our renewal lease wasn't yet granted and wasn't backdated to the expiry of our first lease. Mm -hmm. So there is a period when theoretically that's no tax due, but actually that would be rolled up, that amount of rents we would have paid there will be treated as a premium? Well, not, not necessarily the full amount of rent. Right. It's the amount of increase in rent that you okay. pay over and above what you paid right. for the first lease. Oh, okay, lease. gotcha. Exactly. Okay. So actually that one every single time is a tax lawyer point, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> okay. But we don't get away with not paying tax. Not, not always. If no. we are in a tenancy at will and don't backdate the renewal lease to the end of the first lease, there is going to be some tax. Yes, to pay. it's just albeit a aware premium. Of rather than not. Exactly. Okay. Fine. So from a tax point of view, is it better to backdate the renewal lease to the expiry of the first lease and not have it as a premium? Mm. Or you can, can that go either not. way? Uh, it can go either way, but I, ideally if you're if you're if both parties are happy and commercially aware that it yeah. was a tenancy at will, it's better not to backdate unless there is a commercial reason right. to do so. Okay, fine. So that's a tax one every time. Okay. Uh, right, having completely bamboozled our brains and with not much time to go, let's just have a look at our, our final um, scenario, yes, is that one? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, so let's go for a stamp duty lease. Yay! I mean, we don't see many these days uh, occupational leases because lots of them have expired, but a stamp duty lease, one granted before the 1st of December 2003. Um, and say it's inside the 54 Act, I'm sitting there holding over, what, about, what am I doing tax-wise on that? Yeah. We come across, as you say, this, uh, more rarely now. This is actually dealt with in a very similar manner to scenario three above. So the holdover period is not subject to SDLT, provided that there is no implied lease or periodic tenancy. Mm -hmm. Instead, SDLT is payable on the rents under the new lease. And again, that premium point comes up. So the premium includes any increase in rent payable during the holdover period when compared to the rent under the old stamp duty lease. So this increase is treated as consideration for the grant of the new lease. And if there's no increase, then there will be no premium to pay above. Precisely. Okay. Exactly right. Fine. And if I'm holding over under a stamp duty lease, there's no tax to pay on that holding over period, is there? No, there isn't. Provided, you know, there are some caveats to it where if you haven't changed or varied the lease such that, you know, there's surrender and rerun, something that yeah. pulls it into the SDLT regime in the past. You could just sit there and hold over and not yeah. pay any more SDLT. Yeah. Wow, if you've got a stamp duty lease, but inside <laughs> the 54, I just keep holding over. Yeah, provided you don't do anything else with it. <laughs> I'm always cautious about that okay. point. Okay. All right. Okay. So that's the best case scenario, isn't it? Holding mm -hmm. over on a stamp duty lease. Uh, there's no tax at all in totally for the holding period. No. Yay! Good. Right. Okay. So entirely, you know, all those kind of things. Any last points to, to remind us of? Any yeah. other points that to throw into everything? Yeah. I mean, as you, as I think you've already seen, the legislation is a bit of a minefield, and you know, I always refer back to the legislation whenever I'm looking at one of these. So one of the other issues, just to be aware of, is successive linked leases. This is broadly where um, if the facts and commercial agreement between the parties is such that the renewal lease was contemplated when the first lease was granted between the parties, then the first lease and the renewal lease are treated as if they were both a single lease. This has an impact on the SDLT uh, calculation. Um, and the test is whether the grant of these leases are linked as they form part of a single scheme or arrangement or series of transactions between the same landlord and tenant. Which is going to be relatively rare, isn't it? I mean, yeah. they're linked in the fact that one lease is a renewal of the other, but they're not linked because actually you didn't know when you took the first that you were going to take the Stay second. Stay on. Yeah. And taking the second isn't necessarily tied to the fact that you had the first. It's yeah. It's just a renewal. Yeah. It's a separate And you And yeah. usually, you know, um, as long as the new lease was negotiated at arm's length and it can be shown that the first lease didn't contain a right or compulsion on the parties okay. to renew, that should usually be a nice right. hallmark to get you out of that. And a question that I haven't asked you before, which might okay. be a bit mean to put you on the spot, <laughs> quite commonly, and we've done a propcast before, on tenants' options to renew leases, because mm -hmm. it's quite frequent now 
for a tenant to have an option to renew a lease, a contractual option, not just a 54 at right? Yeah. So if they exercise their option to renew, do you think that would be a linked lease? N not unless, you know, the second limb is also met, i.e. the terms were not negotiated at arm's length. So, you, know, okay. you sort of you look at the old lease and say, oh, I have a right to renew. I'm going to renew on exactly the same terms. We yeah. don't even need to talk about this. Oh, okay. yeah. right. So you sort of look at the whole picture okay. before you make a decision Fine. on that. Yeah. And then your filings and your timing of filings. We've touched on that briefly, haven't we? Yeah, we have. Um, but it's just you know reminding that you know for holdover periods, it's a letter rather than SDLT return. There is guidance from HMRC setting out what needs to be included in the return. And finally, I think, again, one point I touched on was mm. some of these will have the 30 days deadline, and whilst most others will fall within the new 14 days time limit. And I suppose the very least you need to include in your letter is the original UTRN, mm -hmm. unique transaction yes. return number, otherwise they won't be able to it's link what you're paying tricky. now to yeah. your first return. Uh, otherwise, you have to write a whole blurb on, you know, or a paragraph on setting out giving them enough information to identify. To go back and try and look for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's so not going to happen. <laughs> is it? Find you, Jaren. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anisha. Uh, we'll stay on the line, as I mentioned, in case anybody wants to raise any questions through the chat function. As I mentioned, the um, session has been recorded. Um, it's the kind of thing you might need to listen to in stops and starts as to digest things as you go along. Uh, it'll appear on the podcast page in a few days or so. If you have any uh, questions or comments, you're very welcome to feedback to um, either me or Anisha. Um, and if you have any suggestions for future topics for podcasts, then please just let me know. Otherwise, as I said, we'll stay on just to see if any questions are raised. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining us. We have um, a question here. Let me just roll up and find it over. Here we go. If you're holding over, but no STLT is payable for the holding over period, you've done your math, mm -hmm. do you still need to file a return? Oh, that's interesting. Do you oh. still have to put in that letter saying we're holding over, there's no SDLT payable, but this is our return in effect? No, you don't. No. Unless SDLT is actually payable. You don't have to write it. You don't have to, yeah. Good news. Okay, and our next question. Uh, here we go. Oh, uh, obviously, after a friend, I feel this one. Uh, does a tenant need to pay interest on a late filing holding over anniversary in addition to the standard penalty? So, if you are late, mm -hmm. if, funnily enough, that first year takes you a bit of a surprise at the end yeah. that you need to do your uh, letter and your repayment, do you need to pay the penalty uh, and interest if you're late? Okay, so technically, yes. Oh. Uh, um, Yes, yeah, hundred pounds. pounds. Yes, technically, Ooh. yes. Um, but I think on the interest point, at least, if if it's very very small amounts, we would normally advise clients to sort of write into HMRC, and HMRC will, at their discretion, decide to charge um, interest. So on they that. might waive the interest. They on might that. because you know if it's tiny amounts, often they might not be. But at the same time, I have seen them raising you know um, letters for. Five pounds or oh. six pounds, and you just think it's okay. not worth the no, not worth the stamp. <laughs> really? um, so but actually, if you miss the fourteen day scenario, you've been holding over. You're doing your growing lease. You miss the fourteen days. Thirty days. Thirty, 30 days. days. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Thirty days. Absolutely. You've got to add the hundred quid penalty. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, sorry, that's bad news there. In the answer to that question, uh, we'll just hold on one more minute or two to see if there are any further questions. Right, as there are no further questions, I will end the session there. Thank you very much for attending.